This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Alex Proyas. How you doing, Alex? Hey, Alex. Good. How are you doing? I'm good, my friend. I'm good. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. I was excited to have you back because of the cool stuff that you've been working on. I've been following you on social media and seeing your shorts and seeing all the you know, the cool stuff that you're doing. And it, it just it just tickles my my heart to see an artist creating and not waiting for someone to give them permission to create. And I, you are a champion of that. So at first, before we even get started, thank you for being that inspiration to so many people out there. Well, you're very, very welcome and, and ditto to you. <laughs> thank you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> so so we're, we're going to be talking about your new streaming platform, Vidiverse, uh, in it, which is sounds amazing and i really wanted to promote what you're doing because i know it's coming from a really great place but before we jump into that i want to want to kind of go out a little bit in your opinion what are the major issues filmmakers have with getting their work seen and then also getting paid to get that work seen yeah well i think it's uh it's kind of pretty impossible and it, you know youtube seemed for a while to be a, a kind of a way through, you know, the, the fact that we could put our <clears throat> content on, we didn't have to ask anyone's permission. It didn't matter what, how good, bad or indifferent, how mm -hmm. much money we'd spent, how much money we hadn't spent, whether our friends or family were in the cast, you know, it didn't matter. We could get our films out there and get people to see it. But unfortunately, you know, YouTube seems to have kind of developed a stricter and stricter policy about uh, who derives any income from such content, you know. And look, you know, the, you know, there's always a success stories of people who manage to stream their content and get millions of views. Um, but, you know, most people's situations are, and there's some good films out there, I know because I've been looking, mm. uh, they get very few views. They just don't know how to get their, their films through the sort of you know, YouTube algorithm, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's really hard, hard for those, those people who, you know, to keep building their their films through that platform. And, you know, there's obviously um, platforms like Vimeo, which are can be much more specifically targeted and you can, you know, the, your films look better on Vimeo, etc. But, you know, there's really nothing between those sort of two ends of the spectrum where, you know, you can uh, your films can get seen by people, and maybe you can derive what little, small amounts of income your film might generate. You know, uh, YouTube seems to soak it all up through um, advertising. You know, they 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 make their billions, but the filmmakers very rarely see any of that. You know, I think that's as a general statement. I think that's. I mean, going back to when the United when the United Artists opened up, when Chaplin and Pickford and and Flynn got pissed off from the studios not paying them that they opened up their own studio. I think that is it's isn't that kind of the way it works with 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 uh, Hollywood and generally just the big business. I think big business in general, when business and art get together in any art form, the artist always seems to get the the short end of the stick, no matter what medium it is. Is that fair to say? Yeah, always. I mean. <clears throat> you know the the entertainment industry and not just film mu music and everything oh, else yeah. um you know work on the fact that it's there's endless streams of exploitable young people coming through uh who want to be exploited you know i wanted to be exploited when i was when i was a young pup you know i was like yeah come on exploit me let me do this stuff <laughs> pay me some sort of you know pittance of of money just so that i can do my thing you know um, and that's kind of always been the way and, and the industry, you know, the, the corporations have always kind of, you know, um, succeeded based on that cannon fodder, I call them, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's still this, the same to this very day. I mean, you know, f you know, Hollywood would rather work with some young pup right now than some schmuck like me who's cynical and who gets how the whole business model works and wants to, to change it, you know. Um, because it's just easier for them, you know, and they'll make all their money. And so YouTube, you know, is is a, a sort of a, a you know an offshoot of that. It just works on the same 
sort of exploitable principles, you know. Yeah, give us your free content. Give it to us for nothing. We'll show it. You know, that's what you get out of the equation and we'll make billions of dollars out of it. I mean, what is it about that business model that works for the filmmakers, you know? Right. And, and you know, it's fascinating because even in the 80s, 90s, even the early 2000s, a studio would have never given a young pup $200 million or $150 million to make a, a tentpole film. But that seems to happen much more now because of what you're saying, like specifically Marvel uh, and, and a lot of – they have a machine basically and I've talked to people who've worked within the Marvel machine and they just kind of just – they just it, – it's like almost insert director here. Yes, they're guiding the process and certain directors have more say than others. But generally speaking, they're giving – like I remember I read an article with Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott's like, I don't even understand how this is – like why would you give – a 25-year-old $100 million and not give Ridley Scott or yourself $100 million to do it. And you're right. It's because you guys know how the game is played and they don't want to deal with you. Yeah. And it's also because, you know, those films, not not to spend another session ragging on Marvel. But, <laughs> no, no. I, but yeah. I do, we do enjoy it, right? No, I, 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 I certainly um, enjoy them as well. But, those those movies kind of make themselves, you know, and it's arguable how important the director is. It's it's kind of like a long running TV series. Everyone knows what they're doing, you know, and certainly the producers of those movies know what they're doing. They've made many countless successes, so they'll just, you know, it just kind of rolls along, and the director comes in and talks to the actors and, you know, hangs out with the actors, I guess, is what the role is, you know. Um, <laughs> so I'm not my, not my idea of filmmaking, really. Right. Um, but, you know, look, good, good, good on them. I just, I just feel like, you know, we, we need to be thinking of other, other ways forward, you know. Yeah, esp yeah especially for, for not only young filmmakers, for artists in general, filmmakers in general, that they need to get not only the work seen but paid for. Um, but I have to ask you, do you have any stories of your misadventures in Hollyweird with, uh, with falling prey to Hollywood accounting or um, something not, you know, you were like, what? Like, at, at what point did you, you know, I'm so I'm assuming somewhere in your journey, you got <laughs> you got a check and you said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, no, it happens to me on a, on a weekly, monthly basis still to this day. For movies um, that you've done? I, I, I received a... Uh, you know, there were these things called residuals, you know, that we used to get, which were actually really great. They kept us alive between movies, you know, because the fact is, as filmmakers, you know, even if you're very successful as a filmmaker, um, you know, you get your payday once every few years and you get paid, you know, I was paid very handsomely, but then that money is going to stretch out over many, many years and it starts to become less significant, you know. Um, so I was reliant on um, residuals to keep me alive, as were many filmmakers, many filmmakers that I knew that I that I know very well. Um, and unfortunately, the residuals, uh, you know, Netflix and the streamers don't pay residuals. So suddenly they've dropped in the last few years to very small amounts of money to the point where, you know, I'll get a check for I got a check for Dark City a few months ago, which was a, which was you know, of note enough to <clears throat> post on my Instagram account for seven dollars and thirty six cents. You know, that's insulting. which <clears throat> which is you know that's a that represents a quarter of the all the total residuals that I received for Dark City. Now that's just kind of insulting. I personally, I'd rather just not get the check. <laughs> I'd rather they just held on to it. I keep meaning to call the authorities that that deal with the residuals and say, just hang on to them in your bank account. Maybe they can earn a little bit of interest until they amount to something over at least over 50 or or $100, you know, because <laughs> quite frankly, it actually costs me more to cash that check. Because um, it's US. It's US dollar. Yeah. It costs me $25 to cash it. So <laughs> I actually I actually lose by doing that, you know. Oh, um, my. It's like that Seinfeld. So, so, it's like that old Seinfeld episode where he got like, you know, 100 or 500 one cent residual checks he had to sign all of them and yeah <laughs> yeah that's just, like what are we doing that's this? exactly right so that's where that's where we're at you know and and you know cut to a few years ago and you know we could survive between movies on yeah. what we were getting from residuals every every year you know it would pan out to enough to keep you you know pay your mortgage and feed your family you know so so that was great so you could work on your scripts and work on your projects and not be beholden to 
to the you know the bank manager the wolves at the door you know um so yeah it's it's not a it's not a good situation we're being pushed into creative people are being pushed into these more and more untenable scenarios you know at the moment um that's been going on for some time yeah i mean if i always tell filmmakers if you want to see what's gonna ha what's happening and it's gonna happen was just look at the music industry i mean music is turned into it's worth it's it has no worth it's like literally pennies yeah. pennies we follow, fractions fractions of pennies yeah it's all about you know data rates and we basically follow where music goes film follows you know which is exactly what's what's going on um you know the streaming the music streaming services are doing very well as are the film streaming services you know and the labels so and the labels and the labels, yeah, and the labels yeah of course yeah as as, as 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 it's always been you know and so of course I, you know we're looking at all this and it's only been exacerbated as we as we said it's only been exacerbated by the by the pandemic it's become more and more extreme you know i went from dreaming of owning a theater one day <laughs> like I, I wanted to you know I've, I've always wanted to own like my own cinema you know like a paying sure you know movie house um and i've gone from that to dreaming of owning a streaming service because i've just got to face the writing on the wall it's like it's just not you know we're just not there at the moment you know we're not when you know whether whether or not we'll get through this um this pandemic and another some god help us something else will happen and will be locked down again who the hell knows who can predict the future now you know yeah it, it seems like the only certainty right now is on the internet yeah and i think that's where everyone's going to eventually i think hopefully cinemas won't go away like the of the, the way of the dodo but i think it will become much more specific very much like broadway is you know yeah. ticket high, tickets will be better it'll be it, we will still want to have those events but going to see an independent film I, I, in a mass way other than if it's no. an art house is yeah. not going to happen it's just too much content to I, fight. I, I agree and and i think that's really the most pertinent point uh, that you've put so so well is it's more you know the cinemas will survive sure but i think they'll be servicing the marvels and the and the and the streamers um uh you know i think there there certainly is a demand for that big screen experience that will probably never go away as a few recent you know releases have shown us but <clears throat> what about everyone else you know um i think we have to sadly embrace the uh well not sadly you know optimistically and hopefully embrace the the uh the internet medium and try and make that our own at least you know right as much and, as possible and there are and there I are remember, i remember hearing about radiohead you know when when the, the 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 music streaming first started hitting hard a few years ago i remember hearing about radiohead releasing an album uh in that way only available over the internet and i'm like gee that's kind of a weird thing to do but now of course i go well that was prophetic you know they were really trying to wrestle control back into their into their camp as individual artists you know and i think that's that seems to be the sort of place where filmmakers are at at the moment but i think but the thing is that it's because like you said earlier in the conversation every filmmaker could put their movie out and on youtube it's uh, tomorrow and anything could go out but unfortunately, just like the musicians, they have to not only be artists, but they have to be business people, marketers, web designers sometimes. They have to have so many other things other than being just the artist to be able to survive as, as just to be able to survive. And if you're not lucky enough to be a Radiohead that built their entire view, their fan base on the backs uh, on the dime of the label that got them to be that big, you know, like, yeah. and, and same thing with, same thing with filmmakers. I mean, I, I've said this many times, like, yeah, you know, Kevin Smith, a Spike Lee, a, a, you know, Martin Scorsese, we know these names because they've been working within the studio system for so long. And that's how, what got their name up there. But like the indie guy who has one indie and didn't have like, you know, studios pushing it, it's hard to get that name going unless you build your own thing up, you know, by yourself. Yeah. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, it's uh, you know, and and it's arguable, you know, whether through the current system, will it get any more of those names coming out of the woodwork? You know, um, mm -hmm. it's a very, very, it's becoming increasing, increasingly rare, and and I feel like that's why it's time for something to to for a new a new way forward. You know, um, you know, the 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 auteur has been kind of 
watered down over the years. You know, we've been made to the commercial um, concerns have tried to diminish the importance of the auteur. You know, I've, I've actually read so many articles about why the auteur theory is, is wrong. And, you know, I grew up with the auteur theory. Mm -hmm. That's what I, they're the sort of filmmakers that I followed as a kid. And that's the sort of filmmaker I wanted to become, uh, you know, and, you know, it's been, you know, a pretty difficult road to get to that point through the commercial system. Um, you know, so I think it's it's um, it's 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 very important that we hang on to that original creator kind of approach to things. And it seems to me that the indie world is where those filmmakers appear these days. You know, the ones that are already the the mainstream auteurs that are already there, have, I think, have done their dash. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know that we're going to get that many new ones appearing through that system. Um, and I think the indie world is where they're going to be uh, coming from in the future. I mean, I think the only way that happens is an indie person gets a shot of a big studio movie. That big studio movie makes a lot of noise and then they can go back and start doing their own indie stuff. Like again, Del Toro was a good example of that, but that's still, we're still going back 10, 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but Tah Tahiki, uh, the guy who did Thor and uh, Thor Randa Rock, uh, Tahiki, I can't, I never could pronounce it, New Zealander. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Wonderful, wonderful. That's a new name that it kind of popped up. He was an indie yeah. guy, got Thor, and then and then now he's he's. But but even then, we're still talking about handful. We're talking about maybe yeah. two, three, four. But the days of the '90s when there was like you know Robert Rodriguez, Spike Lee, you know, all these names just started popping up every yeah. month. It was insane. Yeah. Those but days are gone. Guillermo is not. Guillermo has been around as long as For, I have. I mean, he's not. He's not a fresh. No, he's puppy, not. A, you know, <laughs> no, yeah. he's not. No, he's not a fresh puppy at all. But yeah. he started off in the indie world. But he's, he he came up in the nineties, um, yeah. and he didn't really pop until in the two thousands. But he's been around for a long time as well. So yeah. it's 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 disheartening for. And I think a lot of creators listening now who didn't grow up in the eighties, nineties, and the early two thousands don't understand what that world was like. Um, you know, to have someone like yourself do the crow and then do, do dark city and to do um i robot and these kind of films um it, it's just you know i, I don't know it, it's just a it's sad <laughs> it's just well, sad. i think we may have talked about this on the last podcast yeah. we did but the you know in those days you know i was like hey i'm gonna do a film based on an original underground comic book you know that no <laughs> one's heard of and it's like yeah great sounds like a great idea you know <laughs> here have money to make a movie you know um um you know it was like there was no question about it wasn't you know the industry was still interested in original stuff you know um with dark city in particular you know hey i'm gonna make a film based on nothing based on something that came out of my head you know in this weird world that doesn't exist you know yeah sounds like a great idea let's go let's do it you know um, I mean, this stuff just doesn't occur now. Um, not at that sort of um, budget range, at least, you know. Yeah, right. um, so, so it's um, yeah, it is definitely a, a new, new, whole new world right now. And I think the only one really doing it, the only one out there who could who could be the auteur and also work within the studio system is Christopher Nolan, and he's the only filmmaker I know that has the juice that he's got right now. I mean, I don't know if you saw the details of his deal, but I was like, Jesus, he's got he wants everything. I think this is fantastic. Give that man yeah. whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, um, no, it's like you know, he's a he's a very rare exception. Yeah. I don't think anyone is in that situation. But look, you know. I mean, we're, you're only as good as your last movie, really. Um, Correct. You know, no matter who you are. I'm, I'm no sure are. his Warner's deal was probably even better than than the one that's just been publicised. <laughs> I think he's probably taken a little bit of a step backwards based on the box office of uh, the last film. You know, so right. uh, you know, it's it's uh, no one. It's, no um, one's bulletproof. A rarity. No yeah. one's bulletproof. There was a moment in time where I, I heard people saying, "Oh, it's over for Spielberg." He's done uh, because yeah. he and he did a couple of bombs back to back, and then of course he came out with Jurassic Park and Schindler's List in the same year and said and shut everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Oh, really? Let me do this for yeah. you guys." Um, yeah, exactly. But that's just the way the game is played. That's the way Hollywood is. But I wanted to ask you. You know, we talked about YouTube a little bit. Um, is there a 
because obviously there's a lot of people making money on YouTube and you can make money. A living is another question, but you can't make money on YouTube with a massive amount of content or a very specific niche. But I haven't seen filmmakers make money on YouTube. No, like I haven't no. seen and short that, films and, the real, and stuff. Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, th like what you do is perfect for YouTube and, and, right. you know, doing commentary, doing reviews, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to be an information based success story youtube you know um and i know from the sort of stuff that i watch on youtube i very rarely go hey let's check out someone's short films i'm only doing it now because of what <laughs> i'm proposing you know but right. it's not the place to go for short films you know um having said that some filmmakers that i know have had you know one-off huge successes suddenly their short film takes off you know often that's um you know that's supercharged by you know, groups like Dust or these these um, these com these sort of um, ideas that basically promote you know genre based content. You know, right. um, uh, you know, but it's it's not it's not a perfect model, and it's and it's partly because and nor is nor is Vimeo a great model because you never know what you're going to get. You know, you never know as a as a viewer what you're going to get when you you know buy a subscription to to um, to Netflix. Uh, you know, it's it's a little less of a crapshoot. I mean, it's it, that's a bit of a crapshoot still. Mm -hmm. People don't consider it as much because there's so much more available. But, you know, there's a certain quality control that goes into what you're going to be able to tune into. And a lot of it's very heavily promoted and advertised. So you kind of know what you're getting. You're getting, you know, when you subscribe, you know, YouTube could never be that because it is a completely scatter, random, scattershot kind of approach to to content, you know. So, you know, it's always going to be that little thumbnail that grabs your attention. Someone being angry about something usually is what <laughs> grabs your attention. And off you go and you're going to watch the first 30 seconds before you realize, you know, you don't want to watch this thing and go to the next thing. You know, that's the YouTube right. viewing for you. Not conducive to watching a story being told, you know. Um, so, you know, look, uh, that's I think that's really the key and that's why it doesn't seem to work for people. Other than, you know, some, as we say, some of the success Anomalies. stories, Anomalies. there can be, you know, a guy watch, playing, you know, playing computer games, you know, and it's like, oh, geez, well, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I don't, being, you know, someone who wants to watch a story being told, um, it's not really my cup of tea, but it's obviously the cup of tea of many, many millions of people, you know. Now, it, you know, you've you've had the, the, the privilege of, of working on, Indie, indie projects as well as giant studio projects, all feature films. But you tend to keep going back to shorts. I wanted to ask you your opinion on shorts as a medium in general. Do you think it's something that is valuable, not only for artists to express themselves, but valuable for filmmakers to either grow their careers or experiment? Or What's your feeling on shorts as a general statement? I think absolutely everything you've said. I, I do think they're very valid. I mean, I equate them to being like, you know, as a writer, you write novels and you write short stories. I mean, people don't turn away from the short story form once they've written a novel. It's just as valid a form of, you know, create creativity. Um, and I've always liked short films. I like watching them. I've been the, the, the uh, on many juries to judge short films. I've been to, you know, in festivals all over the world to judge short films and features. Um, but I think they're just as valid an art, an art form. And the only reason they haven't been considered by the mainstream is available art form is you can't make any money out of them as a as a as a producer or as a as, as a studio you know um so that's that's really the reason it, it's they've I, I believe the art form has never really taken off but as an art form it's completely valid as a filmmaker you learn you know there's a real art to telling a succinct story grabbing someone and grabbing an audience and holding an audience for that short period of time is a, is a huge art form, and it's one that, you know, I discovered making TV commercials and music videos way back when, you know, um, and one that I continue to explore and experiment with in, you know, narrative short story, short short filmmaking, you know, um, and I encourage everyone to continue doing it. I've, it's actually interesting. I've noticed a few filmmakers, a few feature filmmakers recently, because I've had a I've had a short pop up in a few festivals around the world. And I've noticed others, there's some other feature filmmakers out there like me um, who also have been, 
you know, sending their short films out to festivals to, to because it's one of the few sort of outlets for for short filmmakers. You know, so it's it's kind of interesting. I think a few a few other people are probably think feeling the, the way I do about them about the the medium right now. You know. Yeah, it's always it's you know monetizing shorts has always been the problem. I've been able to do it a couple times, um, but many times I failed being able to recoup my money or actually make a, a hefty profit. It's rare to be able to do if you have something that's focused on a niche audience, maybe things like that. But uh, it, it's tough. It's tough, and and I've seen so many people try to figure it out. You know, which brings me to Vidiverse. And what you're doing with Vidiverse. First of all, what is Vidiverse? And when did this idea come up to you? When, when you was it when you dis, when the idea came to you? Was it when you decided I can't buy a movie theater anymore? This is ridiculous. I need a streaming service. How, when did this come up? And what yeah. is it? Oh, look, it's been on the, it's been on on my mind for many many years. And in fact, <clears throat> I actually <laughs> tried to create a um, filmmakers uh, website uh, twenty years ago. Um, called mystery clock um which was you know with with the view to to eventually do what we are now embarking on with with vidiverse it's taken all that time for the technology to get to the point <laughs> where you're not watching postage stamp size oh god you know, it was so um, bad films it was, it was um, so bad <laughs> yeah yeah but you know i built a future proofing my 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 world my filmmaking world going this is where it's going to go eventually Back then, I had that sort of prophetic vision, um, and I knew that it would take some time. I just didn't realize how long it would take, you know. So that site sadly failed eventually. But here we are now in in uh, 2021, and this stuff is doable. And I think, you know, for me, the 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 idea came from the fact that, um, you know, we can't, you know. It was it was a multi pronged thing. One, you know, one is Vidiverse wants to eventually be streaming features and everything, you know, um, but we're starting with shorts because shorts to me seemed the real weak point for independent filmmakers, you know, and I and as as I say because I've ju- I've been judging so many short film festivals recently, a lot of uh, isolation type style film f- festivals because of the pandemic. I mean, I've been blown away by the quality of the work. It's really out, outstanding, you know. And um, I just did one uh, a few months ago here called Flickerfest. It's a big, a big deal in Sydney. Um, mm-hmm. We managed to sneak in between the lockdowns, and it was a, a live event. They did it in a in a sort of open air area in um, on the be- near the beach in Sydney, um, so we could all you know occasionally pull our masks down and drink our beers as we were watching <laughs> the shorts. And it was an awesome. It just reminded me again of mm-hmm. not just this power of theatrical presentation, but more so the power of the short film medium. You know, the audience had a great time watching, you know, an, a two-hour program of short films from all over the world, different genres, different different ideas, different um, narratives. But the one thing they had in common was there was a quality to them all. They were all of really high quality, and it was actually – really really hard i watched maybe um i was judging the international program and over over about a couple of weeks i think i watched maybe 70 move uh, short films and it was really hard to pick winners because there were so many great ones you know and we actually end up creating awards prizes for specific um films that the, where the prizes didn't exist because we liked the quality of the film so much you know that's awesome so i think through that process i started thinking you know it's it's just criminal that these films are not seen by a wider audience beyond the sort of the 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 you know the film festival circuit. Um, and I started thinking more and more specifically at that point about creating a, a streaming service that could program a bit like the way a film festival works, program uh, a series of short films that were maybe even more um, had, had more common threads to them maybe genre or stylistic threads that could bring a program of six, seven, eight short films together. And then whether there was some way to monetize that for the filmmakers and also, of course, for the, for the platform to exist to create uh, a, a market and a, and a, uh, uh, for, the, for this content, you know. Um, but basically saying, okay, well, we are me and, as I said to you, at the beginning of this call was 
you know, at the moment I'm looking at all the films myself mm -hmm. because to me the curated aspect of this is really important that, you know, I initially and, ho and hopefully eventually others at Vidiverse can maintain a standard of curated quality so that, so that then we do have that guarantee to an audience who are coming into it and paying money to watch these films that may or may not be available in other parts of the internet. But we're saying if you come to us, we guarantee that you're going to get a package of great content, great film, film filmmaking, you know. And that's really the whole sort of, you know, uh, origin of this of this idea. So so Vidiverse at the moment will accept you're accepting short films, you're looking at short films. Is there eventually going to be a financial um you know arrangement for the filmmakers as far as you know profit sharing things like that or right now is it just purely an exhibitional uh platform and we want to um, to have a uh you know a licensing scenario and we're not we don't want to exclusively license because for me it's all about i don't want to limit filmmakers ways of making money if they if they're making money from their films in other ways I don't want to get in the way of that, you know. And some of the films that we're dealing with, yet they are already on other platforms, you know. So we're not about exclusively licensing, but we are about packaging uh, short film content with other like-minded short film content to kind of supercharge their potential to make money, you know. Um, you know, we'll be cutting trailers that are not just one person's film, but a series of short films that are all part of the program, um, and that way, as I say, a, a, a um, subscriber or a or a user of this platform can uh, at least get a you know you know if you like one, you'll probably like the others kind of approach, and and watch a program that's you know not just ten minutes long, but is feature length long, you know, or maybe even longer. Um, of, of short films, but they're buying into the program as such um, and any funds that are generated because, you know, the reality is this is all highly speculative <laughs> whether or not much, much funds are generated or not, of course. you know, is, remains to be proven. Um, but all those, whatever funds are generated will be uh, split between Vidiverse and the filmmakers involved with each with each package you know so is this um, at least that's the con at least that's what we're embarking upon and then if we go when we get into features and when we get into you know we want to get into like if we like specific filmmakers we want to get into programs of specific filmmakers work you know many of these filmmakers have created more than one short film so if we like one we'll probably like more so we'll, we're investigating that with a few filmmakers at the moment to to basically monetize their brand and make their brand something in this quest for the auteur, the new auteur, to create a kind of brand identity within Vidiverse for, for individual specific filmmakers. You know? Now, is this going to be, is this TVOD, uh, SVOD, AVOD? I want to say that it's transactional, is it subscription or is it advertising based? We're, it's probably going to be a combination of things, that, um, and we're still we're developing it, so we're still trying to nut through the the the, the logistics, let's say. Um, and you know, and we're also trying more specifically, but it is a process we're going through right now. And part of the reason we're still kind of you know uh, working that stuff out is because we're not certain right now how big a platform we want to launch. You know. This Alex just started off from me going. I just want to get my own stuff out there on a on all my shorts. I want to take it off YouTube and get it onto a platform. Let's just launch that. And I've got this project called um, Mask of the Evil Apparition, which is doing very well in the festival circuit at the moment. Use that as a way. Let's just try it and see, right? So it went from that, and like all my other mad projects, it starts off at a very crude fundamental level and then evolves into this monster and. So we're in mid-transformation into the monster right now with more and more. And I was saying I'm a bit fearful about talking to you and you, you getting the word out because I'm <laughs> fearful of how many more short films I'll actually have to watch you know, and how, and how much less of a weekend I'll have with my family as a result. Um, um, so we're trying to balance all those factors before we go, yes, it's subscription model um, and... And we don't want people to come and be disappointed by how little content there is. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's a balancing act, you know. 
So it, it may launch, I want to, you know, personally, um, and there are other people involved, other, other partners involved with this venture who have their word as well. But personally, I want to see this launch as soon as possible. My, my feeling is to launch it with whatever we have, you know, and, and make it like a sampler and maybe give people, give subscribers a kind of early adopter discount if you decide to subscribe with the small amount of content that we have, knowing that it's going to grow into something much bigger. So it will probably end up being something along those lines, you know. Fair, fair enough. And, I, you know, this seems, first of all, this has been fantastic. I love the idea of what you're doing. Um, I love that you're doing it and your taste and your curation is doing this, which is what I love because there's been a lot of other streaming services that pop up. I get contacted by streaming services, new streaming services on a weekly basis. Hey, we got this new streaming service. Hey, we're for the independent filmmaker. And I look at their sites and I'm just like, I, 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 I can't even, you know, I've been offered, like, could you buy our streaming service? Like, no. Uh, <laughs> like, no, I don't want to buy your streaming service. Um, but the but when I saw you doing it, I was like, okay, this is something more interesting. It just takes everything up to a, a different level when you're involved uh, because I'm such a fan of your taste and, and of your filmmaking that I think what you're bringing in, I think your, your I, I guess your, um, your lens Everything's being funneled through your lens, and that's what's exciting. I'm like, okay, he's going out and bringing in this amazing content. I think that's a big selling point for what you're you're doing. But I'd love to ask, what do you, what do you, what's the what's the goal five years from now, ten years from now? Do you you know how big do you want to get? What do you want this to eventually be for filmmakers? Um, I, I hope this can be a, a real thing. I, I, I really think I, I, I you know I hope that we can make it a viable industry that people can <laughs> actually create their content, uh, put it on this website and earn enough from their content that is, you know, that makes it viable for them to keep making content, you know. I mean, we're trying to, uh, across the board with everything we're doing right now, is reevaluate the economic structure of filmmaking, you know. Um, from producing to making to to develop from developing to producing to distributing, right? Mm -hmm. And Vidiverse for me is the sort of final prong of the of that tri tri triangle of creation, which allows filmmakers to get their stuff seen by people. Because as we've always said, if it's one thing to make your film with all this wonderful technology that makes <laughs> it affordable and easy to do. If no one sees it, then it's like the tree falling in the forest, you know. <laughs> so the dis distribution part of this is, is is absolutely essential. So I hope that this is the final part of that, you know, um, that can make make it a viable, a new viable way to make films and to survive and to earn a living making films. You know, now that's a, a lofty goal, and I certainly think that's a few years off because I'm not guaranteeing that to any individual mm -hmm. filmmaker who's you know submitting their work to to vidiverse at the moment you know I'll, if i if i manage to get them a check for a few bucks uh um, at but, the end of every quarter i'll be like yeah that's a success story you know but i hope we can build on that i hope as more as we get more subscribers more people interested we can keep building this as, as an idea you know now, but will the residual check be bigger than your Dark City residual check is the question. Well, I, I, I <laughs> You can't, can't guarantee. guarantee <laughs> <laughs> but the hope but, is know, that you can make it a little bit more. Look at it on those terms, right? <laughs> Isn't that <And> scary? <laughs> when you when you look at it on those terms, you know, I I can I've just made this film called Mask of the Evil Apparition, which is going to be one of our first launched <clears throat> vid so-called vidiverse originals, right? We're going to launch it. <laughs> And say you can buy this short film by this this schmuck Proyas for <laughs> you know two ninety nine or whatever whatever you know fifty cents or whatever we're gonna put on it we don't know you know um, mm -hmm. or subscribe and you get it for free or whatever we're gonna say you know and honestly I, I would be amazed if I, I, you know there've been so many people reaching out to me from my own followers going how can we see this film yes we'll pay for it yes let us know and we're there and that's a maybe a few hundred people and maybe there's more people out there you know maybe some of those people are lying maybe they won't pay for it when they they see the trailer mm -hmm. um but 
it's going to be more than seven ninety five. You know, I mean, I am going to get a little bit more. I know. <laughs> so there you go. The model already, I it's believe, working. will work. It's you know? already working. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the bar, the bar is low at seven ninety five. Uh, right. The, the exactly. bar is fairly low that you've got to break for this to be a success <laughs> for you. Yeah, you should frame that. You should frame that check in the offices of Vidiverse, like every yeah. day, guys. <laughs> every day, that's what we are. Go break that seven ninety five. Yeah. Now, exactly. when is so? Exactly when is this? Right. When are you releasing this to the world? Well, that I can't. You're specific about either we're hoping before the end of the year or early in the new year um, okay and again it's about re reaching that critical mass where we go yeah this is great and you know we're, we're we're building the the site again we have no there's no financing behind this it's all me waking up one day and going yeah i'll put some of my own dollars into that idea that stupid idea and i've got my heretic foundation colleagues who are helping me create this uh this thing so it's a it's a somewhat unplanned. There's an it's an unplanned business plan right now, um, <laughs> so you know that's why it's a little has to remain a little bit flex. Of course, of course, you're still trying to figure this all out, but I think yeah. the intentions are good of what you're trying to do, and the uh, the idea is solid, and I can't wait to see what the what you guys come up with. I, I really yeah. can't. And I'm, I'm so, well, I'm so. And, and can I, and can I also, yeah. I'll just be clear though, that the, the site is, oh. is open for submissions. You know, mm -hmm. we are actually accepting submissions from anyone and whoever, whoever, wherever they are, we're, we're, we're getting submissions from all over the world right now. And language is not an issue for us. As long as there's English subtitles on the project, we're getting really cool stuff out of Europe and, and, uh, and Mexico and all sorts of great, great um, filmmaking um, uh, centers. Um, and so, you know, we're open for business in that respect, at least to create what that library is going to be before we launch. You know, that's that's awesome. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what you come up with. I mean, I'm so I'm so happy that, you know, filmmakers like you are still going up to the plate and taking the big swings where many, many don't. Many just stick to their own work and their own art, but you're actually trying to help other filmmakers and try to give other filmmakers voices in the next generation a way to keep doing this in the way that, you know, you and I were able to do it when we were, you know, coming up. It's like, you know, a way to sustain ourselves as artists. So I'm so, uh, I'm so happy that you're still taking those swings, my friend. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I think we have to. It's, it's a, uh... It's a, a kind of a existential crisis that we're all in. You know, we're all in <laughs> yeah. it together in that respect. Um, so I feel like it's 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 got to be done. You know, and uh, you know, I, I I think what you you know what you mentioned earlier on is important. That you know, my my you know, you are seeing stuff through my lens. Um, I've always said over the years, people always ask me what I think about people's <laughs> other other filmmakers' work, and I go, I don't, I never want to be a critic or a reviewer of other filmmakers work because I don't it doesn't matter what I think about the work every film is hard to make it doesn't matter whether it's good bad or indifferent you know they should be um, you know they should be um, uh, you know encouraged because they've made a film you know um, and it's the same with with every with every level of filmmaking I, I believe you know um, and and it's kind of this is kind of my opportunity to encourage films that I really like. You know, um, it, it's it's for me a really s specific way of doing it. I'm not criticizing other films. All, all I'm saying is these films are ones that I think are worth looking at. And you know, the 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 quality varies. The 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 budgets vary wildly. The resources are going into it. The the acting quality, whatever. And it's just stuff that I think is cool, you know. That's really the at the end of the day, um, you know what what uh, what comes through all this 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 stuff, and I hope that we can carry that through um, as we move forward. You know, stuff that's cool and something that holds you, that engages you, that makes you want to watch. Maybe it's because it's doing something really something you've never seen before, something that's weird, it's interesting, that's unusual, or just it's a very it could be a very you know. Uh, small, you know, real world story that's being told in, you know, without any genre kind of influence or whatever. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's all about just something that is, as I say, cool, you know. The cool factor. 
the cool factor. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, n- now, I, I, I really love you to talk a little bit about what you're doing at the Heretic Foundation and what and, and your virtual production studio that you're building in Australia and everything, because I'm I'm a huge fan of the technology, but you you really kind of spearheaded this technology. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we built this studio. Uh, it's it's close to a year and a half, two years ago now, um, which was uh, it's a virtual production facility. Basically, it's a way to um, create. Well, it's it's a, it's actually a bigger idea than that. It's a way to bring all the aspects of filmmaking under the one umbrella. You know, mm-hmm. um, I say ironically now because we've actually just moved into a, our own VFX facility which is a kind of a sister company to, to Heretic. It's still Heretic Foundation, but it's mm-hmm. like where all the VFX get done, you know, because we're, we're growing, you know. Um, but it's a, it's a way to use virtual production to streamline uh, how films are made, to still be able to bring enormous, great production value, but at a, at a lower budget range, you know, uh, when you don't have to move around, when you don't have to go to multiple locations, when you don't have to build big sets, et cetera, et cetera, you can, and you can work faster and more expediently, you can bring the, the, the cost of the production down. Or more importantly, you can elevate the production value of lower budget indie films, which is kind of the real key for me. You know, now that we've actually, we've just completed or we're completing our first feature not my not my film one for another director a guy called john curran it's a film called mercy road which is um uh it's basically it's a road movie at night it's set in real time a guy in a in a truck it's a thriller it's a bit like duel but Mm -hmm. it's kind of more gothic and and sort of dark and and spooky you know um and we've created the entire world for this film we've made the the uh all this you know he's in the truck a lot of the time but he gets out and he goes to various different locations the whole world is basically being created by by heretic uh in in uh in virtual space and we've shot it with a combination of led screens and green screen um uh in, in numerous situations as well and it's looking fantastic it's really quite wonderful what the the, the material that i'm seeing at the moment um so that to me is a great um example of elevating a fairly low budget uh thriller indie thriller to a level where the visuals are ones you would associate with a very expensive you know studio movie you know um uh and uh that to me is an exciting success story already of heretic foundation and and one we hope to keep building on we have numerous other projects lining up that uh, one is a world war two uh film set on a on a battleship uh which again you know they wouldn't even consider doing it on the budget that they have and in fact they've mm-hmm. they've tried to raise a, a, a larger budget and been able, unable to and it's the technology that we're able to bring to it that's making the film actually achievable you know and that's a really exciting world to be in you know now when you say vir- and for a lot of people listening, virtual reality, virtual it's not virtual reality, virtual production. Um, you know, when I think of virtual production, I think of the Mandalorian and then the volume and stuff. Have you if you created similar volumes and yeah. using green screen? So you have a volume, and then you also do some elements in green screen as well. So it's a hybrid, if if you will. Correct. That's right. Yeah, we uh, Heretic. Um, uh, we're currently building a LED volume. Uh, a large LED volume um, with a um, in cooperation with a with another company, um, and we've been um, doing mainly green screen. Our studio has green screen. I mean, it's quite a small small stage. I mean, our studio is really designed as an R and D stage, um, but we're building. Uh, we've just done this one film in another volume, but we're building a dedicated uh, LED volume. It will be LED and green screen because it's the combination of the two that works so well. You know, um, some there are some things that uh, a la Mandalorian LED screens are not actually that great at doing. Uh, when you when your scenes are very dark, there's a lot of black in frame. Um, That's rough. You're right. It's not as not as good. You know, as a, a green screen can actually work a lot better. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's certain things. It's you know, you, ideally you have both at your disposal. We have our um, 
our guys who are running the virtual sets in the middle between a green and an LED volume. And you literally move the cameras backwards and forwards, you know, <laughs> depending on what shot is serviced by what tech, tech, technique, you know. And, that, and that's, and that's the, the ultimate. That's the ultimate goal. And that, yeah, that's where you are. You're there for the duration of the production. You don't, right. You don't that's, your, that's your company move. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly your, right. you're, you're just moving left yeah, or right. That's your company the, move. The lens around that way. <laughs> and, and that's ha- I mean, honestly, that's happened for a filmmaker. <laughs> I mean, anyone who's ever been out and in, in, you know on location, and you're like, oh, we only could do one company move today because we're in the middle of a desert, and, you know. But we, you know, but you could on this kind of production, you can do that. And a lot of things also in virtual production. I've had friends of mine who've worked on The Mandalorian, and you know, the press about you know, you just put the camera and you shoot. To a certain extent, that's true, but and, and I'd love to hear what you think. But there is cleanup work. There is seam. You have to see, clean up seams. You got to do so. There is. It's not like you just shoot in the can. You're done. Yes, you get a lot more done than you used to. But there is still a visual effects hand that's going to touch it and clean things up a little bit. Is that true? Yes, that's very true. And you don't hear that from Mandalorian. The PR of Mandalorian makes it seem like <clears throat> it's a uh, it's. It's a really easy to walk in the park, and let's not forget that they have huge budgets. You know, <laughs> like I've put this together again from my own bank account, at, at least up until this point. You know, um, and you know it's very different to having you know Disney and ILM behind you. Um, uh, but look, you know, I, I'm grateful to the Mandalorian uh, team because yeah. they've they've made this. Everyone goes, oh, it's a Mandalorian, you know. Um, and they're all, you know, it's created a whole sort of mini industry and it's helped my company enormously. So I'm very grateful to you all there at Mandalorian land. Um, but this is not the, you don't need to do all that stuff to to make it work as we've just proven on a very low budget movie and we're continuing to prove. Um, it's ingenuity, a lot of it's ingenuity. Um, the the um, but, but as you say, yes, uh, to, to, to be clear, there is a lot of cleanup work, but it's but you have to be clever about how you do it. Some shots work perfectly well, and other sh- other shots, as as we say, you swing around and you're on the green, and they will work better on green. Um, and the one thing that you have to remember is that it's a double-edged sword having your having your dailies there done in the can on an LED screen because um, if you haven't had the time in pre-production to to get your set, your environment fully specced out the way you want it, you're stuck with it, you know. In The Mandalorian's case, they're not because they can just replace it later on, you know. Yeah. Um, in our case, it's prohibitive to do that. So we have to make sure that um, we have it to a, to a level of finish that we're happy to have baked in to the to the to the dailies otherwise we'll shoot it on green and that's our way of keeping costs down you know um but you know look if you do it right if you if you do the right kinds of shots on led um you shouldn't have to do any cleanup work afterwards you know um it's it should be done it it is possible to bake it all in and get it all done for example in this film that we've just that we're finishing at the moment a lot of the stuff out, you know, in all the car stuff with a guy inside the car, outside the window is 100% LED sure. volume um, uh, because there's so, there's so many shots to finish all those, to composite all those shots in green oh. would have been really a expensive, an expensive prospect. So we've only stripped out the shots at an, an absolutely essential that we do on green screen. There's quite a few of those, but it makes it a, much more manageable thing. It's just, on, on the Mandalorian, they wouldn't care. The Mandalorian, they do it and they go, oh, "I didn't work out, and we'll do it." And you know, we'll do it the other way, you know, um, because they can afford to. So yeah, they'll, just, they'll rotoscope out the shot and and clean yeah, up and do exactly. whatever and, yeah. and do it in whatever they want. Um, no, it's 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 pretty amazing technology, and, and uh, yeah, I'm always I'm always fascinated by all that. And you know, uh, the thing that's also really interesting is a lot of people think that you have to do if your virtual production has to be this big sci-fi world building thing but no you're the story you're talking about the film that you're talking about is not is it might be genre and stuff but it's not a uh a sci-fi world creating dark city style project which you know something like 
rear projection. This is basically just really nice rear projection <laughs> with with yeah. with being able to move the camera and the camera following the, the parallax on it. Yeah. Um, but I could only imagine what Stanley Kubrick would do with this technology. <laughs> yeah. Well, he liked he he did it. I mean, he did it with. That's the funny thing about the Mandalorian claiming to have invented. I don't know whether they ever did, but other people yeah. claim that they claim. It's for uh, projection. They virtual production, yeah. <laughs> it's I mean, for it's projection. been around since the day one, you know. And and I, look, the, th- the thing about virtual production is that what what really is the key, is not so much the screen or whether it's LED or green, is the marrying a computer-generated model that's that, to, the, to the live camera. And as you move your camera the model will move accordingly. Mm -hmm. That is what virtual production is. And in fact, I know exactly who invented that. And I can't say that it was me, but it was almost me because um, uh, the first two films that were done using a very early version of, um, of uh, video of uh, virtual production was, uh, was um, Spielberg's AI and my iRobot. Right. That were the first films to actually use the the technology. Um, we, um, you know, at the time that we did uh, uh, iRobot, I I didn't know that this stuff actually had already been done. But I was like, I had a scene with Will Smith running around a thousand robots, mm-hmm. and I didn't have anything real. I only had Will Smith and one robot which was used as a stand-in <laughs> so i go how do we do this scene how can i move my camera around and know what i'm seeing through these rows of robots you know do we put a thousand cut bits of card uh, cardboard maquettes or something and they came up with this thing called and it was called encoder cam which was the early rudimentary virtual production thing where we had it had the model on on the stage my camera on a techno crane could move around and I'd see this sort of, you know, very rudimentary 3D model move as my camera moved. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is incredible, you know. Yeah. Um, so that that really was the origins of virtual production. Um, and then now that's been combined with, as you say, um, rear screen project a new form of rear screen projection right because L- when yeah. irobot was around uh, the leds uh not so much uh not, not that affordable <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe about this big you know this big was about ten thousand dollars yeah uh, <laughs> it was all plasma back then um <laughs> hey listen i still got my i still have a plasma tv from like 15 years ago and it still looks fantastic and it's still yeah. <laughs> Still rocking at 720p. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> so, now, um, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about is a little birdie told me that you might be working on a series for Dark City. Is that true? Uh, I have no idea where you heard <laughs> that information. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I mentioned it to one to one person um, and on a podcast a bit like this and I mean, it was great to see so many people picked it up as a story. So so much of the the sort of genre based, um, you know, uh, industry picked it up as something uh, to of note, which is great. It just showed me that there's a lot of, and you know, I kind of knew there's a lot of, st- you know, interest still strong there in the in the in the wings for for a, um, a dark city a continuation of the dark city story. Um, but of course, you know, I mentioned it way earlier than i should have we're still you know i should have said and i'm trying to sell a dark city (laughs) series rather than and i'm making a dark city as as, as opposed to like so so when is it streaming uh and what and and when when it's coming out november is it november people assume it's like it's happening already and it's you've um, shot it it's been in the can you're just in post (laughs) i've had so yeah i've had so many actors uh, applying to screen test and and writers applying to write episodes, etc. So, so th- this is kind of me saying, don't you know? Let's let's all calm, take a big deep breath. Um, calm down, guys, and and wait a moment before you know before I say anything too much more about it. Um, look, the only thing because I like you, Alex, so much as you know, the only thing Thank I can say about it, and no, and no, knowing that's the caveat that we're we're just we're we're working it out at the moment. We're not. Mm-hmm. We don't have. We're not. We're not green lit. We're far from it. You know. We haven't. Mm-hmm. I haven't even written any of it yet. I've, we're still working on our on our pitch on our concept. You know. But what I will say is, um, it is very much a continuation 
of the the original movie. Um, awesome. It's uh, it's not a re it's not a reboot as a as a more more of a sequel to the original movie. Um, so that's something that, that um, maybe will you know is one bit of information that is people would would want to know about. Um, um, and you know I'm trying to I mean it is. It's you know it, obviously in doing a TV series we have to appeal to a bunch of a, a, an audience that maybe don't even know about Dark City they've got no idea of this film Dark City um, and there's plenty of those people around um, but at the same time every year that goes past more and more people become Dark City fans it, you know it, this has been going on since the first the original release so many people come, have come to come to it every year going wow we never knew this movie existed this is great and become new fans you know so i'm also trying to create a story that uh that makes those people happy you know and be be, be is faithful to the original uh um, fans of the series and and works into what they would want to see you know um so i think i think we're there i think we've come up with a with a concept that will work for for both sides of the spectrum and and also as i say bring in new hopefully bring in new um a new audience as well you know well uh that's exciting news and i i i want you to have that that canvas to play with and to go re- revisit that world because it's such a wonderful and rich world and um god i would love to see it so i wish you nothing but the best but everyone listening calm the hell down it's he he's not in post everybody he's not in post in it already it's not coming out for christmas everyone needs to calm the hell down (laughs) sadly that's the case and look you know this also feeds into the technology that we've just been talking about because you know dark city was made at the time and i barely could afford it even then They, they didn't give me a huge budget but they gave me enough where i built the entire thing we had these massive sets built um in this kind of aircraft hangar size space in sydney we built the entire street that we kept reconfiguring much like the film was to service all our all our different scenes you know um and you know obviously the 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 time has gone uh, uh you know when you could do that on a film like that um but now of course this new technology is is enabling me to make the that world in an even better way i believe um I don't have quite the fun on the set of hanging out on those <laughs> in those cool spaces, but beyond that, you know, the virtual production gives you a world that looks every bit as great. Uh, and again, I'm not having to limit my imagination because even on something like this series, which will hopefully be financed by you know a legitimate studio with the the the, the money to throw at it that that it necessitates there's going to be a limit there i'm going to you know they're not going to let me go crazy um but in the virtual world i can i can Mm -hmm. do whatever i want i can visualize it however i want to and um and and so i think it's the right time for continuing the visual aspect of dark city uh in a in a new in a new form you know i have to ask you just out of out of curiosity when when you're going to pitch a show like this I, obviously, there's going to be a lot of concept art, but would you create like a sizzle reel, like using your technology going, look, this is what we can do? Because I know Robert Rodriguez did that with Sin City and, and you know, like when there's new like technology, you're like, look, guys, I know it normally would cost $100 million, but we could do it for five and this is what we could do and this is how we do it and look what it looks like. Are you gonna? Are you planning on doing something like a little sizzle reel or no, something? No, we, because the movie is the sizzle reel. You know? Right. Um, so there's no real reason so so if there are any executives uh who uh, uh <laughs> have have my fate in their hands uh i go say watch, to them, go watch it go and watch the movie you know right right um and, and uh, you know look fortunately i have i'm i'm uh involved with some people who are who are big fans of the of the original movie so so that's that's really that's really key um but um but you know yes if it wasn't for that that movie existing absolutely you know that would be the the first thing to do um i've got a film called sister darkness that we are um that we're trying to finance at the moment that is um we're doing just that with you know we've created we've actually created a little 
a little trailer and all that sort of stuff. And it's all virtual production. Um, just to show people the, the kinds of the, – the way it's going to look, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so um, yeah, absolutely. It's nice having a studio at my fingertips for such things. Yeah. Um, oh, it's always I, very, very helpful. You know? I, I've been, I was in post for most of my career, and I loved having the ability to just like, oh, yeah, I've got my VFX team. I've got my post team. I can just, you know, do – whatever I want. I never even on the budget. That's so funny. Whenever I do a project, but the budget line for, for post, I just never even included it because I use, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to do the post. I'm going to edit it. I'm yeah, going to call it. Of course. It's of course free. It's I'm going to call, yeah. I'm going to color grade it. I'm going to master it. I'm going to output yeah. it for deliverables, all that stuff. So I never even think about even schedule. Like how much does that cost? Jesus Christ. I've got a lot of value. I should charge more for this. Um, <laughs> now where can people submit to Vidiverse and, and submit their films? It's vidiverse.com. Um, That's V I D I. V I D I verse. V I D I diverse. Yeah, vid, vidiverse. Um, I expect you, you'll get a run it underneath me. Oh, right? I'll, I'll like put it I, in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. As you do this, yeah. I, will have um, my, yeah. I will have my team. <laughs> if the have team is listening, team. my team, yeah. as, do it one more time. Do it one more time. So vid, vidiverse. Vidiverse.com. I'll make, sure, yeah. I'll make sure um, I'll make sure they do that. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, so it's all self-explanatory. I hope on if you go to that website, it explains exactly what uh, what is required of you. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, please uh, send us your films, and uh, and um, and uh, we can do something great together. You know, Alex, I appreciate uh, you being on the show again, coming back. I appreciate everything you're doing with Vidiverse. I love that you continue to take big swings uh, at the play for everybody. And uh, you also have a fantastic first name as well. So uh, thank you, my friend, <laughs> for doing all that you do. And, and uh, thanks again for coming on the show, my friend. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure again. And hopefully we'll do at least one more time. Uh, at least time yeah, in the, the, when, you, yeah. when the Dark City, Dark City series releases, yeah, of course, you come yeah. back and then we talk yeah. about it then. <laughs> yeah, thank, yeah. thank you, my friend. Cheers, mate.